Carl Gustav Jung was one of the most prominent figures in the field of psychology, who lived in 20th century. However, his work has been influential in many other fields as well. Because he thought, since psychology is the study of human soul, it should be studied together with other scientific fields. For example, study of anthropology, biology, philosophy and religion helps us understand the human psyche more profoundly. And even though Jung considered himself as a rational scientist, he gave a lot of attention to matters that are regarded as irrational or esoteric, or in other words, the occult. This is in a sense what makes his thought system unique and intriguing. Carl Jung was born in Switzerland in 1875, in a village on the shore of Lake Constance. His father was the village pastor and his mother was the daughter of this guy, a well-known eccentric theologian. This family background with mixture of medicine, theology and spiritualism had a certain influence on Jung's intellectual development. In fact, his doctoral thesis revolved around the mediumistic sessions of his cousin Helen Preiswerk, who supposedly had contact with the spiritual world. In his book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, he states that Experience shows that many neuroses are caused by the fact that people blind themselves to their own religious promptings because of a childish passion for rational enlightenment. Psychologists of today ought to realize that we are no longer dealing with the questions of dogma and creed. A religious attitude is an element in psychic life whose importance can hardly be overrated. In the early years of his career, Jung had a close collaborative relationship with Freud, which lasted about five years. Freud even considered him an heir, someone who would take forward his new science of psychoanalysis. But partly because of temperamental reasons and partly because of different visions, it became impossible for Jung to follow Freud. He eventually resigned from the presidency of Psychoanalytic Society and went on to found his own school called Analytical Psychology. In a chapter in his book explaining the contrasts between himself and Freud, he describes Freud's ideas as one-sided and even dogmatic. Jung blames Freud for ignoring the fact that every psychological teaching which is the work of one man is subjectively colored. The contrast between Freud and myself goes back to our essential differences in our basic assumptions. Assumptions are unavoidable and this being so, it is wrong to pretend that we have made no assumptions. In the same chapter, he also criticized Alfred Adler, a pupil of Freud and the founder of individual psychology. While Jung says, Freud's ideas are commonly accepted by intellectuals, Adler's ideas are more accepted by educators. He then suggests analytical psychology as a more comprehensive approach that includes both. I prefer to call my own approach analytical psychology. I wish the term to stand for a general conception embracing both psychoanalysis and individual psychology, as well as other approaches in this field. Jung favored a more phenomenological approach in his work, which means he strived towards expressing as clear as possible what he has observed and experienced. For the purposes of psychology, it is best that we abandon the notion that we are in a position to make statements about the nature of the psyche that are true or correct. The best that we can achieve is true expression. By true expression, I mean a detailed presentation of everything that is subjectively noted. True expression is giving form to what is observed. So in order to achieve this true expression, when coming up with the concept, he didn't like to use obscure words. Instead, he paid particular attention to using words that are self-explanatory. Actually, some of these words are now among the best-known psychological concepts and are widely used today even outside of the academic circle. Now let's look at some of these concepts that you probably heard before but didn't know that they were invented by Jung. Complexes The word complex is today widely used both in academic field and in daily talk. This word is quite self-explanatory in that it refers to the intermingled content in our unconscious that can create disturbances in our consciousness. These complexes are in the personal domain of the unconscious and are the clusters of images and experiences. They detach from the ego because of their conflicting nature and they have their own emotional charge. That's why the complexes need to be dealt with for a healthy psychological growth. I will explain the nature of the complexes in more detail in another video. Now let's move on to other concepts. Introversion versus extraversion. In 1921, Jung published a book called Psychological Types. In this book, 
he mentions four functions of the brain, which by the way I explained briefly in this video here. And besides these four functions, he names two attitudes, introversion and extroversion. These two quite self-explanatory words are commonly used today, but with a slightly different understanding. We tend to think that this system separates people into two different groups. But Jung saw it more like a sort of spectrum, which becomes useful when different characters are being compared. Just like there are no two categories of tall people versus short people, but rather someone can be taller than someone while shorter than another. Similarly, a person can be more extroverted than someone else while also being more introverted than another person. In my video series on psychological types, I will go into more details of these two attitudes. But for now, we move on to the next concept. Collective unconscious. At the end of the 19th century, the idea of an unconscious mind started to gain popularity. One of the most influential figures that contributed to that popularity was Freud. But in Freud's school of psychoanalysis, the unconscious mind was accepted as a personal reservoir of memories and experiences. Jung, however, thought that a significant part of the unconscious is not personal, but collective, which suggests that it is shared in all human beings, and at a deeper level, even shared with animals and plants. An individual inherits these contents at birth and carries them to the next generation, quite similar to our DNA. The idea of collective unconscious also seems compatible with the theory of evolution and comparative anatomy. Because our bodies are the results of millions of years of evolution, and we share much of our DNA with other species. For example, we share 50% of our DNA with bananas, and around 99% with chimpanzees. So it seems quite reasonable to think that our brains also share a lot of content with other species, and of course other human beings. If of course we presume that the mind and brain are one and the same. Another way to look at this is that there is a part in our brain that we inherited from our ancestors. And this brain part is responsible for some of the behavior patterns in primitive tribes, and even animals in the past. So even if there is no contact with those past generations at all, a current individual can create the same behavioral patterns as his animals and human ancestors. Jung takes this a step further. He claims that certain patterns and symbols of mythology, religion, fantasy and even dreams have been manifested repeatedly throughout history. That is why a person can see mythological and religious symbols in dreams even if that person has never in his life come into contact with those symbols and images. In his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, there are some interesting accounts of patients who had dreams and visions that contained such symbols, while they had absolutely no chance of coming across those symbols in their individual lives. Psychic Reality This final concept is a bit more complicated than the previous ones, and it might require a bit of interest in philosophy for a better understanding. Jung thinks the dichotomy between mind and matter in philosophy becomes a problem when we approach the psyche from a scientific point of view. Here, a pure materialistic approach reduces psychology to physical mechanisms in the brain and is counterintuitive in many aspects. First of all, this approach excludes free will as it is bound to explain all our behaviors, thoughts and feelings as physical processes, just like the algorithms of a computer. On the other hand, Assuming there is a spirit alongside the matter, or soul alongside our bodies, is unscientific, and has the danger of dogmatism. So, Jung suggests the term psychic reality. If we are to approach the human psyche without a reductive approach, we ought to use this term. Because everything that is experienced in the psyche is the same in terms of psychic reality. Certain psychic contents and images are derived from material environment while others seem to come from a mental source which is very different from physical environment. Whether I picture to myself the car I wish to buy or try to imagine the state in which the soul of my dead father now is. Both happenings are psychic reality. The only difference is that one psychic happening refers to the physical world and the other to the mental world. If I change my concept of reality in such a way as to admit that all psychic happenings are real, this puts an end to the conflict of matter and mind as contradictory explanatory principles. Whether this statement is convincing or not is up to you. But you can read more on this topic from Jung himself from the source provided in the description of this video. In the second part of this video, I will explain some other concepts of Jung and his theory on dream interpretation. It is going to be another exciting video. So if you don't want to miss it, please hit the follow button below and stay tuned. Thanks for watching.